Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Mark Todorovic and today we're talking about alcohol metabolism. Now some of us like to have a drink and to find out exactly how many of us, a National Household Survey here in Australia in 2001 demonstrated that 8.3% of Australians over the age of 14 drink on a daily basis. They also found that, this is a large number, 90% of those between the ages of 20 and 29 years of age drink regularly. So alcohol is quite a common drug. Now today I want to talk about how that actually works, how alcohol affects us and how we metabolize it. Now you know that when we ingest alcohol orally and we're drinking alcohol that when it gets to the stomach around about 20% of that alcohol is actually absorbed. So at the stomach here 20% is rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream at the small intestines, that's where the remaining 80% is absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, what you're going to find is because alcohol is water soluble, it actually transports very rapidly to every organ of the body. Now, it can get to the brain within five minutes, and if you're a pregnant mother, the placenta as well. Now, what we do know is that when alcohol jumps into the bloodstream from our GIT, gastrointestinal tract, it's going to travel via the portal vein to the liver where it's predominantly going to become metabolized. Now in actual fact, you're going to find that within 30 minutes, alcohol is going to be at its peak concentration after ingestion. Now, I want to talk about standard drinks and percentages just so we've got context here, okay? Now, what you're going to find is that a standard drink of alcohol, so one standard drink, so this is predominantly maybe a finger of whiskey or vodka, maybe a single beer, for example. Whatever is classified as a standard drink has approximately 14 grams of 100% ethanol. Now remember that alcohol being ethyl alcohol, which is ethanol, written as ETLH is going to be what we're talking about today. And 14 grams of 100% ethanol is how much alcohol is in one standard drink. Now what this equates to for somebody about my body weight, around about 70 kilograms, is that this ends up being 0 0.2 grams of alcohol per kilogram. Okay, now what this translates to is approximately 20 milligrams per deciliter of alcohol. Now today we're going to talk about alcohol in this context, milligrams per deciliter, because that's what's clinically relevant. So one standard drink, for at least me, is about 20 milligrams per deciliter. Now what you're going to find is that, at least here in Australia, the legal limit of alcohol in our blood that we can operate a vehicle is around about 50 milligrams per deciliter. And what this equates to, because you probably don't refer to this at least colloquially, you refer to this as 0.05% blood alcohol. So this is the amount of alcohol in our total blood is 0.05%. Now this is the legal limit in Australia and that's approximately two and a bit standard drinks. All right, how quickly does our body break down and eliminate this alcohol? Well, in actual fact, it can break down a single standard drink every hour, which means every hour you can metabolize 20 milligrams per deciliter. So hopefully that's putting things into context. Maybe we can talk about milligrams per deciliter in the context of what it does to you and how you manifest. So 50 milligrams per deciliter of alcohol what, or zero to 50 grams, what it can do is it can start to make you cheerful, happy, maybe your judgment begins to waver a little bit and you start to make some poorer decisions potentially. As we start to move from 50 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, our judgment begins to diminish even further. We can start to slur our speech as well, and we start to release or reduce our inhibitions. 100 to 200 milligrams 
per deciliter. You start to get ataxia. So these are issues with balance and muscle coordination as well. And as we start to move from 200 to 300 milligrams per deciliter, this is where you start to not just have slurred speech, but you start to have memory loss. You start to have nausea and vomiting as well. You start to have double vision. Now, if that's not bad enough, what about if you go above 300 milligrams per deciliter? Well, this is where you start to really have some issues. You can start to go into respiratory distress. At least you're hitting that point where it's very hard to stimulate you or wake you into consciousness. It's coma, potentially. Now, what you'll find is that this is for somebody who does not often drink alcohol. What about alcohol? Now, when I say doesn't often drink alcohol, I'm referring to somebody who isn't an alcoholic. Now, if somebody is an alcoholic and they abuse alcohol, have too much alcohol, you can actually find that they can tolerate up to 700 milligrams per deciliter of alcohol or ethanol. Now, again, what does this translate into blood percentages, which is probably what you're used to? Well, again, this is around about 0.05, the legal driving limit in Australia, which is about two standard drinks. Here, we're going up to 0.1%. Here, we're going up to 0.2%. And all the way down here at 700, we're going to 0.7% blood alcohol, which I said alcoholics can potentially tolerate. Now, what's the difference here? Well, that's about 12 standard drinks drinks okay sorry it's about 12 times the legal limit not 12 standard drinks more than that 12 times the legal driving limit all right enough of that let's talk about metabolism when we drink alcohol like i said it's going to go into our portal vein because it's absorbed at our GIT, the stomach and small intestines it goes to the liver and it's going to jump into hepatocytes, which are liver cells. So I want to draw up an hepatocyte. Now, what's going to happen is this. We're going to have ethanol, ETOH. Now, what's going to happen to ethanol? Well, the major way, the major metabolic process that we break down or metabolize alcohol, this is the majority, greater than 80% of ethanol is metabolized this way, is through the alcohol dehydrogenase metabolic system, which turns ethanol into acetaldehyde and turns acetaldehyde ultimately into acetyl-CoA. And this is happening in the mitochondria. Not all this, but the acetyl-CoA is. Now, when we turn the ethanol into acetaldehyde, it's doing this using an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And when we turn acetaldehyde all the way down to acetyl-CoA, we're using acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Now we sometimes write alcohol dehydrogenase as ADH, but don't get that confused with antidiuretic hormone. Sometimes we write acetaldehyde dehydrogenase as ALDH. Okay? Now, this another important point here is when we go from ethanol to acetaldehyde, we actually use as a substrate NAD and we turn NAD into NADH. Same thing happens here when we turn acetaldehyde ultimately into acetyl-CoA. We're turning NAD into NADH. All right, keep that in mind because we're reducing NAD and we're turning it into NADH. And when I say reduce, I'm saying reducing the quantity of NAD and turning it into NADH. All right, another important point is this. When, it, when you look at the genes that turn into ADH, all right? Or transcribe and translate into ADH. Not antidiuretic hormone, alcohol dehydrogenase. There's two transcripts, or two variants, I should say, which actually make this process go quite fast. And that means if this process is going quite fast and you contain one of these two variants, you're producing a huge amount of acetyl aldehyde. 
Now, luckily, there's a variant of acetaldehyde that allows us to metabolize that quickly into acetyl-CoA. However, 40% of the Japanese, Chinese, and Korean population have a problem with this acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. In actual fact, they can have a mutation in one of their two copies, which turns it off. Now that means that they're not gonna be very efficient at metabolizing acetyl uh, at acetaldehyde into acetyl-CoA. So that means that they metabolize ethanol really quickly and produce a huge amount of acetyl uh, acetaldehyde, but then that starts to accumulate and they start to get very sick, okay? They start to get hot flushes, redness in the face, for example, sometimes vomiting. Another important point is that 10% of this 40% population actually have two variants in this ALDH. And that means that both copies are turned off, which means they can't metabolize acetaldehyde at all. They get very, very sick. Now what this means is that there's a percentage of the population that will never become alcohol dependent and abuse alcohol. All right, now this is the majority of the pathway. What happens with the acetyl-CoA? Well, a couple of things. Predominantly, we're gonna turn that acetyl-CoA into water and carbon dioxide. Now, of the alcohol that's been metabolized here, 10% or up to 10% of the alcohol that we actually ingest can be excreted via urine, via sweat, and via our breath. Now, in actual fact, when you breathe out alcohol after drinking it, it actually comes out in the same concentration as it is in your blood. This is the reason why breathalyzers are used and are so successful, because they accurately demonstrate what your blood alcohol reading is, whether it's 0.05% all the way up to that 0.7%, which hopefully nobody is. This is the majority pathway. Let's talk about some other pathways. Alcoholics, for example, or people that drink far too much alcohol, don't just use this pathway, they actually trigger another pathway. Now this pathway is happening at the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's draw that up. And what's gonna happen is that this ethanol is going to the endoplasmic reticulum, go through a couple of steps, turn into acetaldehyde, and it does this because of a very important enzyme called CYP, cytochrome P450. Let's write this down. C-Y-P, I'll write it up here, cytochrome, P450. Now in actual fact, there's a specific variant of this cytochrome P450 that does this, and it's cytochrome P450 2E1. And what it does is it takes excess ethanol for people who have ingested far too much ethanol or alcoholics, and turns that ethanol through a couple of steps into acetaldehyde. Now, the problem with this is that CYP2E1 is used in xenobiotic metabolism. Now that means it can be used to break down certain types of uh, toxic products coming into the body, including alcohol, cigarette smoke, pollutants, and so forth. And often what it spits out in this process is reactive oxygen species. Now what reactive oxygen species do is they start to attack the cells of the body. And that means people who ingest too much alcohol tend to activate this pathway, spit out ROS, and what they end up doing is attacking the hepatocytes and the liver, damaging the liver. So that's one way that liver can be damaged through alcohol. Now, in this process, what's also happening is that NAD is used as a substrate and creating NADH. So further, what's happening? We're reducing the amount or quantity of NAD and we're increasing the amount of NADH. Keep that in mind. There's one last way that we can metabolize ethanol. Now this happens in peroxisomes. So the SIP happened in endoplasmic reticular. This is happening in peroxisomes. And what actually happens here is the ethanol 
enters the peroxisome with the help of hydrogen peroxide, which we know is in large quantities in peroxisomes, turns into water and acetylaldehyde. So what I'm saying is that all these metabolic processes, apart from excreting it via your breath, urine and sweat, all these metabolic processes turn ethanol or ethyl alcohol into acetaldehyde. And that means acetaldehyde goes right up and must turn into acetyl-CoA. Now, a couple of other things is that in all these processes, we're reducing the total amount of NAD and increasing the total amount of NADH. Now, why is this important for us to know? One of the reasons is this. Acetyl-CoA is very important when it comes to fatty acid synthesis and also fatty acid oxidation. And in actual fact, what you're going to find is this. In order for fatty acids to be broken down to be used as energy, called fatty acid oxidation, we need high amounts of NAD. Now, we don't have high amounts of NAD now because of this ethanol metabolism. And so we can't break down fatty acids to use as energy. And in actual fact, what ends up happening is we can use these high amounts of NADH and these high amounts of acetyl-CoA to produce fatty acids. So we can take NADH, take acetyl-CoA, use it to create fatty acids, and then we store these fats as triglycerides in the liver. And that can lead to a fatty liver. So what's happening? ROSs from this cytochrome P450 pathway. Now this is the microsomal ethanol oxidizing system, the MEOS, you may have heard of it. ROS damages the cells. All this acetyl-CoA, all this NADH can create all these fatty acids which are stored as triglycerides in the liver itself. And the last thing that results in alcohol damage in the liver, or one of the last things, is that when this ethanol moves through the system, if it gets to the colon where the majority of the bacteria are, it can damage this bacteria. And a lot of this bacteria are what we call gram-negative bacteria. And gram-negative ne ne bacteria, when they start to die off, they like to release something called lipopolysaccharides, LPS. I'll write it down though. Lipopolysaccharides. These are sugar moieties that sit on the bacteria itself. They can be damaging. They can also stimulate inflammation, which is what's happening here. These lipopolysaccharides are jumping into the bloodstream, tra traveling all the way to the liver, stimulating Kufner cells in the liver. So we all know that there are Kufner cells in the liver. I'm finding it quite difficult to pronounce that. And what these Kufner cells do is they stimulate all these inflammatory molecules to be released. These are cytokines and tumor necrosis factors. And what they do is they result in inflammation at the liver. So what's happening in alcohol metabolism to damage the liver? You've got reactive oxygen species being made and this is because of these SIP enzymes. You've got fatty acids being produced and stored. What else is happening? You've got inflammation because of the LPS, lipopolysaccharides, being released from the broken down bacteria in the gut going to the liver. Now, another important point is this. Have you ever found that when you drink alcohol in excessive amounts, Late at night, 2 a.m. maybe, you start to get hungry, even though you have eaten. Why is that? Well, remember that your brain only uses sugar for energy, only wants glucose for energy. Now, when you go through this glycolytic pathway, breaking down glucose to form energy, you actually need NAD, and it's actually inhibited by high levels of NADH. So in actual fact, all these high levels of NADH is inhibiting the glycolytic pathway. You can't use glucose to make energy. So the brain doesn't get any energy and the brain thinks it's starving. So the brain tells you, let's go out and get a 2 a.m. kebab. And what do you do? You get a 2 a.m. kebab. Still can't use the sugars, but there's a lot of fats in there. And so you further increase the total amount of fats in your body, which again will likely be stored around the liver. So this is alcohol metabolism. Hopefully it answered some questions for you and I'm Dr. Mike Todorovic.